Welcome to the Healthy Skin Wins presentation. Thanks for taking the time to learn about best practices in pressure ulcer prevention. Our hope is that you will increase your knowledge and improve your practice in treating and preventing pressure ulcer development while helping your patients enjoy a short and sweet stay at Seven Oaks General Hospital. This is an interdisciplinary, collaborative team approach involving all health professionals. But it doesn't stop there. We want to ensure the patients and their caregivers are also included. So what is a pressure ulcer? Some people may not know it by that name, but if you said bed sore, most people would be able to tell you it's a wound or hole in the skin caused by laying in one position too long. They may also know that they occur in areas of the body that are bony, such as heels, elbows, hips, and the pelvic region. Many people don't know that there's actually more to it than just pressure and immobility. It's because of the pressure that there's a lack of blood flow to the area. The lack of blood flow means a lack of oxygen. And when skin cells don't get oxygen, they die. But skin cells don't just live on oxygen. They also need water and nutrients from the food we eat. Of course, pressure is preventing all of these ingredients from getting where they need to be. So how and why do we classify? It's important for all healthcare professionals to speak the same language and use the same terminology. It facilitates best practice. That is, once we know what something is, we know how to treat it. This is just an example, and the colors may not be true. You're looking for redness and swelling. If you were to gently press on it, it would stay red. This is considered a wound, and action needs to be taken. It's where we want to catch these. Uh-oh, the skin is now open. No damage has yet occurred to bones, muscle, or fascia. However, this can be painful. The wound will continue to deepen if no action is taken. Oh no, this is getting serious. The wound has deepened to the next layer. There may be undermining, tunneling, pain, a lot of wound drainage. At this point, the wound care nurse must be involved. Wounds at this stage are extremely hard to treat, and the patient is now at risk for bone infection. Interdisciplinary collaboration is a must. Surgical intervention may be required. At this point, hard black eschar has covered the wound bed, and we don't actually know the depth. This wound needs debridement and therefore our doctor colleagues and wound care nurse should be involved. As you can see there are many contributing factors. This is just a list of intrinsic or internal factors. These are the ones that vary from patient to patient and the healthcare team actively takes each one of these into consideration. Here are the external factors. These factors are within our ability to control. We can have an impact here. Our SOGH wound care initiative targets these factors. So what can we do? The basis for the pressure ulcer prevention program is the Braden Scale Risk Assessment Form. The expectation is that it be performed within these parameters. Here is the area of the form that deals with assessment. There are six sections of assessment. Sensory perception, moisture, activity, mobility, nutrition, friction, and shear. We will look at each one in more detail. First, the sensory section. Sensation is the body's ability to detect meaningful stimuli through touch, pressure, and temperature and to respond accordingly. Sensory loss may come from such conditions like diabetes, stroke, spinal cord injuries, and dementia, to name a few. It's important to watch for nonverbal signs of pain or discomfort. Next, the moisture section. 
Moisture could come from any number of sources. Urine, feces, perspiration is a big one for some people. And then there's fluids that are spilled or left behind after a bath. What's important is how much moisture is the patient exposed to. So how can we control moisture? Well, first of all, avoid multiple layering. Avoid leaving slings, blankets, excessive padding, soaker pads under patients. It'll just lead to perspiration. We need good toileting and bathing routines. We need proper incontinence management, including the proper use of briefs and timely changes of products. And we need to limit soaker pad use for those that are assessed to need one. Remember, not all elderly patients require incontinence products. Only patients that meet the criteria should be on a disposable soaker pad. This product is very effective in wicking away moisture, but is costly and so should be used sparingly. This is the activity section, taking a look at the degree of physical activity. This is the mobility section, looking at the ability to change and control body position. For those patients who cannot independently mobilize or reposition themselves, a consult to occupational therapy or physiotherapy needs to be considered. Healthcare providers also need to be mindful of repositioning frequency and techniques, sitting support surfaces and sleeping support surfaces. Repositioning needs to be considered for all at-risk individuals, regardless of their sitting or sleeping support surface. At-risk patients should be repositioned every two hours, and please use a slider for patients who cannot reposition independently. Here are some things to remember when repositioning a patient. Do not drag the patient or use soakers, bed sheets to reposition. Use friction-reducing sliders and enable the patient to participate as much as possible through the use of trapezes and bed rails. Avoid positioning the patient on bony prominences and do not position a patient on a pre-existing pressure ulcer. Take care to remove slings and medical devices such as tubes and drains from underneath the patient. Here are just a few more things to remember when repositioning a patient. Do not use donut cushions or sheepskins to offload areas at risk for pressure ulcers. And when a patient is lying in a supine position, the head of the bed should be flat while repositioning. If it is necessary to elevate it, it should not be elevated greater than 30 degrees. Offload a patient's heels when they are in a supine position by using pillows or Prevalon boots. Here we see the proper way to elevate the heels and offload. And this is the wrong way. Also, when a patient is in a lateral sideline position, they should be in 30 degrees of sideline. Use pillows to keep bony prominences from coming in contact with each other. And to avoid pressure on the greater trochanter, do not place patients in a 90 degrees sideline position. Here we're looking at the proper 30 degree sideline position and the incorrect 90 degree sideline position. Sitting up in bed should be avoided. Use a wheelchair or other suitable chair instead. The sitting position can create a lot of pressure on numerous bony parts. This prolonged pressure can create big problems. Here Spider-Man is properly seated. Okay, there's a lot going wrong here. Spider-Man is uh, sliding out of the chair and notice the multiple layers. There's a sling and um, an incontinent pad under him. Here's a photo of an Acumax mattress. It's what all patients are on. It's a, an advanced therapeutic sleep surface with pressure redistribution properties 
and it's indicated for patients who have up to stage 3 or 4 uncomplicated pressure ulcers. Here's the KCI mattress. It's a powered air mattress that is indicated for patients who may need a higher level of pressure redistribution based on their medical condition and risk factors. Ordering a KCI mattress should be a collaboration between physician, patient, nurse, and an occupational therapist. Friction and shear. Most people know friction. It's the degree of resistance when there is movement between two surfaces. Shear, on the other hand, occurs between two surfaces when one is moving and the other remains static. Consider this. If the head of the bed is greater than 30 degrees, the chances of shear occurring are greater. Soakers are ineffective in attempts to reduce friction and shear during the repositioning of a patient. Sliders are the most effective choice. They are also easier to use and kinder to the body. It's important to have good communication and a setup. Let's watch what happens when you don't. Oh my goodness, Rex, we have to get you up to your pillow. All right, let's go. One, two, three. <laughs> now let's watch what happens when you have good communication and the patient knows what to expect. My goodness, Rex, we need to get you all the way to your pillow. All right, what I want you to do is tuck your chin towards your chest. On the count of three, we're going to move you towards your pillow. One, two, three, and up. Good job! <laughs> okay, this is important. If a patient scores two or less in the friction and shear section, consider a consult to the wound and skin nurse if discipline-specific criteria is also met. Last but not least, nutrition. Look at it this way. Energy, protein, hydration, vitamins and minerals are essential for healthy skin under normal circumstances. For wound healing, we need even more of it. Here's the scary part. Over 40% of hospitalized patients in Canada are malnourished. Poor nutrition and hydration is a contributing factor for pressure ulcers. And patients that always eat less than half of their meals are probably not eating and drinking enough and at risk for malnutrition and skin breakdown. Here's the very simple, very visual assessment of patient food intake tool. When collecting trays, simply place a check mark in the empty box that best describes the patient's food intake for that meal. There's one row for each meal. So please use the assessment tool. Nurses will document in the flow sheet that patient's intake is very poor when patients always eat less than one third, probably inadequate when eating about half, or adequate if consistently eating more than half. Nurses can identify patients with poor intake and consult the dietitians. Consult dietitian if patient is eating half or less of their meals for more than three days. Dietitians can assist patients in providing higher protein and energy meals, make recommendations regarding the appropriate vitamin mineral supplements for wound healing, and optimizing blood sugar control through diet. Finally, this part of the form has, of course, date, time, and the total Braden risk score, and then specific recommendations based on the score that you've obtained that you can implement immediately. SOGH is committed to pressure ulcer prevention. By utilizing the PUP flow sheet and the interventions outlined in this presentation, you can help be a part of this initiative. Thank you for your commitment to patient care.